program is brought to you by NewsWorks in cooperation with the Eau Claire Area School Board. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's six o'clock. I know Commissioner Lyons is not here, but he is in the closed session and is getting some information from Abby on another item on our agenda. So I told me that it was okay for us to start uh, with him not here just for the roll call and he's there at closed session now. Uh, Maida, will you confirm that we're in compliance with our open meetings laws? Yes, we are. Thank you. Can you call the roll, please? Commissioner Nordeen. Here. Commissioner Johnson. Here. Commissioner Zur. Here. Commissioner Bika. Here. Commissioner Clements. Here. Commissioner Harder. Here. And Commissioner Lyons is not present at the moment. Thank you. Our first order of business tonight is a closed session under Wisconsin State Statute Section 19.851E. Uh, we will be discussing the CPI increase. I would like a motion to adjourn to closed session, please. So moved. Second. Uh, moved by Johnson, second by Harder. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All right, motion carried. We are adjourned to closed session. We will readjourn here in open session at approximately 7 p.m. Hello, everyone. The board has, clo has just adjourned its closed session. I've given the board uh, an additional two minutes to take a break, and grab something to drink or whatever they need. We will start the open session of the meeting at 7.05. Thank you. Okay. I will once again call the meeting to order. The board has acted on the CPI uh, increase for the year and will communicate those that action to the parties that need to know about it uh, as we go forward. Uh, at this time, if you are willing and able, please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Tonight, we do not have any members of the public signed up for public comment, and so we will move directly into our board and administrative reports. We'll start as always with our superintendent, Superintendent Johnson. Good evening, Mr. Dean, board members, student representatives, and executive team members. Over the last few days, it's been incredibly busy across the district, even with, uh, without the inclusion of the decision from our special board meeting on Wednesday. We're preparing for next year on a variety of fronts, including staffing and budgeting and allocating resources to address this past year's impact of COVID and what it means for us beyond the school year. Teams of principals at the specific levels are focused on this impact and it appears in each of their agenda items when they meet for their weekly teams calls. Since our last board meeting almost two weeks ago, we had experienced our third professional development opportunity on equity for administrators in our system leaders group. I truly appreciate the detail and opportunity for growth as a system and look forward to every Wednesday per month as we're able to spend with our facilitators from UW Eau Claire. This will begin to impact our system at the staff level very soon as I already noticed some of these tenets and activities lead to discussions in our team's staff meetings at the school level. This is precisely the impact and systemic change we need to serve our students and families better. Last week, I knew spring was approaching as the elementary schools I visit have a different feel at recess time. The students I see sledding are no longer on snow covered surf surfaces. They tend to start on snow and then shift to some dirt and sometimes a little bit of the parking lot as our temperatures get warmer and the days get sunnier. It does not seem like our elementary students mind. After our decision to add K-5 students to in-person learning for four days a week starting April 5th, there had been an immense amount of planning with a couple weeks to prepare and implement before spring break. We appreciate the work of the elementary principals group who met and formed smaller committees to ensure the implementation is as smooth as possible for such a change to our system. I respect and value the work of our directors and executive directors to lead, follow, as well as support at this time too. There's an attitude of input and decision-making at every level, district level, school level, and teacher team level that will benefit all stakeholders involved. I would urge all elementary parents to submit your choice of cohort as soon as possible before those deadlines you received 
on Wednesday evening or Thursday afternoon last week with reminders over the past couple of days too, so that we may ensure a smooth transition for your students. There's been that focus on numbers of students in attendance for in-person learning, the class sizes, the ability of teacher teams to provide input and develop systems and schedules individual to their schools and students. We've had a few teachers re reach out to their principals and administrators to develop solutions to slightly puzzling staffing items, not just defining and pointing out the problem, but solving those situations. Finally, I'm very appreciative of the time and effort of Dr. Kaiying Zhang and Kim Kohler in sharing the communication around vaccination. When the City County Health Department had connected with us to inform us of a change in prioritization with our staff order of vaccination, Kaiying and Kim immediately sought the information from KMARC's HR department to reorganize and invite all eligible employees to schedule their appointments for today. Tuesday, Wednesday, and Saturday at Prevea, Oak Leaf, and the mass vaccination sites. They've been working constantly since Thursday with the health department to organize those staff members per the county health department priorities and notify them of those appointments. Kaying and Kim have updated us through the weekend on our district progress. Staff members and priority lists have been notified with extremely low confusion, and that's so positive. Thank you so much for your commitment. Thank you. The president's report tonight, I have only a short update to share with you on our governance policy writing. Last Thursday, Commissioners Clements, Zur, and I finished our initial draft of the results policy section. Governance culture will likely be completed by Commissioner Clements, Dr. Johnson, and myself this Thursday. And then next Friday, oh, this Friday, is coming Friday, Commissioners Harder, Lyons, and I will be meeting to start the drafting of the annual work calendar. We'll be using the draft language as it stands to, to guide this. And so if there are changes that we end up making beforehand, obviously we will alter those in the calendar. I don't want to encourage all of my colleagues on the board to review the drafts and submit comments to me in preparation for our special work session, March 29th at 7 p.m., in which we will discuss any issues outstanding for those policy drafts in preparation to consider them for adoption in April. At our next regular board meeting on March 15th, we will once again welcome Jan Berg and Steve Tempus from Forest to our regular work session. The topic of the discussion will be meeting structure in the new governance model. So if you have questions, please feel free to send them on to me so that I can send them on to Jan and Steve and help them prepare. Thank you. Next, we'll go to our student representatives reports. We'll start with our representative from Memorial High School, Emery Toole. So, um, neither of us have much to report on tonight. Both the schools are progressing pretty normally. You know, students are kind of wishing for spring break at this point, but not much else to report on. Thank you. And now we'll go to our representative from North, Zoe Wolf. I also don't have much to report on. Um, I know the junior class is very stressed for the ACTs next week, so that's had an effect on everyone, but other than that, not much going on. Thank you. We'll now move on then to our school board committee reports. We'll start with budget development. Commissioner Harder. Good evening. Budget development has not met since our last uh, full board meeting, but uh, we will be meeting again soon. Thank you. Demographic trends and facilities planning, Kim Kohler. Good evening. The Demographics Facilities um, and plan or Facility Planning Committee met about a week and a half ago. We heard um, an overview of the Applied Populations Laboratory study. We're going to dig a little bit more into the, um, that data at our next meeting and hope to share it with the board shortly. Thank you. Leap, Jim Schmidt. Uh, we have not met since the last uh, regular board meeting, but we meet a week from tomorrow. Thank you. And I was not able to attend policy and governance the Thursday after our last board meeting due to some personal issues. So I've asked Commissioner Clements to give the report tonight. Thank you, Dr. Nordine. Uh, policy and governance met on February 18th uh, with a full agenda. We reviewed and updated policies utilizing the term handicap to ensure contemporary and consistent use of terms throughout our policy manuals. 
Uh, we also went through policy 536 professional staff resignation to update process and timelines to be consistent with our annual HR calendar cycles. Uh, we reviewed rule 511 employee discrimination complaint procedures, uh, policy 423 participation non school non public school students in district courses and dis and policy 424 public school open enrollment. Uh, that was a mouthful um, relating to um, students who are not in uh, our, our ECASD ES, enrollment and how they may take courses if they're in our geography. And finally, uh, we reviewed policy updates to policy 441.2 student representations at school board meetings to potentially include uh, virtual school and McKinley representation in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Next is our legislative update, Dr. Johnson. Governor Evers signed on January 20, the special session Senate Bill 1 into law on February uh, 25th as 2021 Wisconsin Act 4. This new law would, among other things, provide businesses, schools, and governments with liability protections with COVID related lawsuits. The U.S. Department of Education sent a letter to the chief state school officers inviting states to request a waiver for the 2020-2021 school year of the accountability and school identification requirements in the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. A state receiving this waiver would not be required to implement and report the results of its accountability system, including calculating progress toward long-term goals and measurements of interim progress or indicators, or to annually meaningful differentiate among its public schools using data from the 2020-2021 school year. The letter also addresses assessments and makes it clear that waivers from federal assessment requirements will not be issued by the Secretary of Education. The Wisconsin uh, Department of Public Instruction uh, is seeking additional Wisconsin residents to take part in its initiative to collect information on internet connection speed to improve access around the state. Test your speed using MLAB speed test, which takes less than 30 seconds. The speed testing project will continue through March 31st, 2021. The Department of Public Instruction recently released a new public dashboard of Wisconsin internet speeds by school district. The dashboard shows speed test data for school districts over specific time ranges. On February 16th, the state Senate approved Senate Bill 55 on a bipartisan vote. The bill modernized the publication of minute proceedings uh, held by school boards and other governmental bodies. Thank you. Thank you. We now move to our consent agenda. The board considers approval of the consent agenda with one vote and without discussion. If any board member wishes to discuss an item, it will be pulled from the consent agenda and voted on separately. Tonight's consent agenda includes minutes of February 15th, 2021, minutes of closed session, February 15th, 2021, minutes of special meeting, February 24th, 2021, human resources, employment report, Eau Claire virtual school expansion, transition program. Commissioner Lyons. President Gordine, I I would request that we pull uh, item 8.7 from the consent agenda. Okay, uh, so then I would hear a motion to approve the consent agenda consisting of items 8.2 through 8.6. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All right. Those opposed? Any abstentions? All right, uh, we'll now uh, take up item 8.7, the transition program. Commissioner Lyons, I'll recognize you first to explain the issue. I absolutely support this program. Um, I just, uh, within the, the presentation that we are approving, uh, I do want it uh, noted it, just in the, in the meeting record, that the construction costs that are associated with the renovation uh, should be in compliance uh, with board policy on competitive bidding. Uh, 
So, Abby, I know you've been asked about this already. Is there anything that you can add to us so that we can help to understand better what this looks like before we make a decision? Sure. Thanks, Tim, for the opportunity. Um, as we dug a little bit deeper into Board Policy 672, um, it does look like we should put it out for bid competitively. So I know that when we talked about it, um, there was an in construction incentive with having um, Goldridge Group do it. And I, we had done a little bit more research. And so um, I agree with Commissioner Lyon's recommendation that we should put it out to competitively bid to allow the opportunity for other contractors to um, the opportunity to do that work for us. Thank you, Abby. So what I'd like to do here is I'd like to first get a motion to approve the transition program. And then Commissioner Lyons, I would ask you to make a motion to amend the, the motion to include a competitive bidding for the remodel. And then we'll, we'll take that motion and we'll apply it. So I'd first like to hear a clean motion to approve the transition program. So moved. Second. Moved by Harder, second by Zur. Is there a discussion on the motion? Commissioner Lyons. I'd like to amend the motion to include that construction costs that are associated with the transition school renovation uh, should be in alignment with board policy on purchasing and bidding. Is there a second for the amendment? Second. Any discussion on the amendment, the amendment to require that we follow policy for competitive bidding? Dr. Johnson? Yes, yeah, so it, it, uh, following policy after that, though, the, 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 the assumption is just to ensure that putting it out the bid comes lower than that 5% uh, uh, discount that was uh, provided by the uh, um, the company that's leasing, is that correct? No, the putting it out to bid allows for um, others to take a look at what the um, what the work that's needed to be done to renovate the space. And so um, if we're putting it out to bid, I don't know what that would look like from Goldridge. So Goldridge had offered us um, the estimated construction cost of 225000 with an allowance for the cabinets if we were to do them to ourselves for 25000 but there was a $50,000 incentive if we signed a 10 year leaf on those construction costs. So that would bring the construction costs, again, I'm just gonna include the cabinet allowance to 175,000. So what we would do is we'd put out, we'd say, here's what we want the space to look like, give us your, um, give us your price. And then we would evaluate those and then award a winner to do the construction work. Thank you. You're welcome. Commissioner Lyons, I see you're unmuted. Do you have additional comments just on this amendment? No, I do not. I forgot to mute myself. Thank you. That's fine. I'll take this opportunity to call the question on the amendment. So the motion is to amend to include following board policy on competitive bidding. Meta, please call roll. Commissioner Nordine. Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Zur? Yes. Commissioner Bika? Yes. Commissioner Clements? Yes. Commissioner Harder? Yes. Commissioner Lyons? Yes. The item is amended. Uh, we now return to the motion on the floor to approve the amended uh, transition program proposal. Is there any discussion on that motion? Commissioner Clements? I was unmuting in preparation of voting. Well, we'll call that a call to question. And Meta, if you would once again call the roll to approve the transition program as amended. Commissioner Nordine? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Zur? Yes. Commissioner Bika? Yes. Commissioner Clements? Yes. Commissioner Harder? Yes. Commissioner Lyons? Yes. All right, uh, so obviously the motion passes and we will now move to our individually considered resolutions. 
We have one item tonight, the adoption of the ECASD equity statement. Uh, I'm very excited to bring this forward for approval tonight. Uh, we had discussion about it one month ago. And at that time, there were a few edits that were offered as potential considerations. And I believe those edits have been incorporated. Uh, Dr. Johnson, do you want to confirm that? It looked like it was as I reread the document in preparation. I did address those uh, those comments. Uh, I, I appreciate that the assistance of uh, Meta with helping me uh, uh, recover the, the mi uh, meeting minutes to be able to make the adequate changes, but I did do that. All right, so at this point, I will open the floor to board members for comments or questions, and of course, uh, eventually a motion. Commissioner Clements. I'd like to thank everyone on the board who has participated in for uh, drafting this um, statement, especially uh, Commissioner Johnson, who really took the lead in um, creating what I think is a really succinct and really powerful statement by uh, the district and, and the board. Um, you know, it is, it is um, largely symbolic, but I think it helps to set the tone for the district, both internally and externally, making it very clear what are what values we aspire to achieve, uh, knowing that it will be tremendously difficult and messy work in getting there. And so, um, I'm really happy that we're taking this this position. We've been working on policy supportive of this uh, for the whole year, and I know that the previous boards have been working in a similar direction as well. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to rolling up our sleeves and working on this really urgent uh, vision and value that we all share. Commissioner Harder. I know the district has begun significant moves and you know to build on work that's already been done in past years but some really significant moves in the last year or so in this direction and i, I my understanding is the staff requested uh such a statement and such policy to be clarified and i'm, I'm really glad that we're able to do that i think it's a, a really well well placed well um well worded statement as well I'll take a moment to extend my thanks, and maybe I'm I'm stepping on some of the work that Dr. Johnson has already done, but to the, the groups of uh, the public that have been involved in this process, and Dr. Johnson, of course, my thanks to you for taking that out and, and making sure that it was seen by the public, by historically marginalized groups, by people of color, and uh, by organizations and communities, to make sure that we have the input from a wide variety of people to really strengthen this statement and have it say what we want it to mean and know that this can be, while it is you know, a symbol to start with, that it's going to be a focal point and a direction setting for not only this work, but ongoing work, governance from the board, from the administration and throughout the teaching staff. So I'm, I'm very thankful that the public stepped up to help with this and, and lent their input. That we, we can't do these things without you. And especially, you know, we look across this board as a group of, of largely white and privileged individuals. It's easy for us to have those blind spots. And so coming together and lending everyone's voice to this process uh, is so important. And I'm, I'm very excited to lend my support to adopting this tonight. And without additional unmutes, uh, I will ask for a motion to approve the resolution. So moved. Second. <laughs> uh, and I would like to do this as a roll call as well. Commissioner Nordine. Yes. 
Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Zur? Yes. Commissioner Bika? Yes. Commissioner Clements? Yes. Commissioner Harder? Yes. Commissioner Lyons? Yes. Thank you, everyone. We look forward to continuing the work that we've been doing and stepping forward boldly with this work and really making a difference, impacting systemic racism of our system and the lives of every one of our students. I appreciate uh, all of the work that you did. We'll now adjourn to our committee reports for the evening. We have two items tonight, the first of which is the annual SRO policy report. For that, I'll turn the floor to Kim Kohler. Good evening. I'm going to start this presentation and um, I'm hoping that you see a large PowerPoint slide right now. Is that correct? We do, Kim. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Um, good evening. Deputy Chief um, Derek Thomas from the Eau Claire Police Department and I are pleased to, to be here tonight to share an annual review of our school resource officer policy. Uh, policy 445 outlines our partnership with the Eau Claire Police Department and our school resource officers. This policy outlines three items um, within the policy that are to be reviewed annually. We review um, the SRO and student contact data. We review the policy and the memorandum of um, understanding. Deputy Chief Thomas and I would like to share information from that review with you tonight. Policy 445 emphasizes that five school resource officers um, in the district were established to provide positive supports for students and families um, and aid students with positive behavioral interventions and supports, provide access to adults who mentor and guide them, and through an emphasis on counseling and supports rather than arrest or exclusion. This policy will be before policy and governance later this week. And at that time, I'll share research information from uh, Wisconsin districts re regarding school resource officers. Um, tonight, we'd like to talk a little bit about the purpose of school resource officers in the Eau Claire Area School District, um, as well as share with you some data. And Deputy, Th Deputy Chief Thomas would like to um, share a little bit about the partnerships um, that school resource officers provide. Thank you, Kim. <clears throat> Again, I'm, I'm Derek Thomas. I'm Deputy Chief of Police. Um, I oversee the Investigations and Professional Standards Division, uh, the division in which the five SROs are within. And before I get into a little bit of what the SROs, SROs do within the school district, I think it's also important, important to recognize the application process that we have for our police officers here at the City of Eau Claire. Um, we vet our officers out. It's a very long, strenuous application process before they're able to put on a police uniform and then before even thinking about whether or not they want to become a school resource officer. Uh, a couple of things that we look for in our police officers as well as in our school resource officers are, you know, problem solving skills, communication skills, character and competence, high moral values, ethics, um, team players, ability to form positive relationships with the community and with school staff and work alongside the community through neighborhood associations and things like that. Um, throughout the course of the process, like I said, it's a very strenuous process. It's about six to eight months long. Uh, they first start with a written exam, physical agility. Uh, they go through the police and fire commission interviews. If they pass all those, then they move on to the chief staff interviews. Where we have a selection of however many people that we have available within our police department, we do background investigations. And I think it's important to note that our background investigations on our officers are very um, tiresome, they're very thorough. Uh, less than 50% of our applicants make it through our background investigations because we want to make sure that we have the right caliber police officer as part of our organization to serve this community. Um, once they once they complete it and they finally get the offer, um, they got to pass a physical and uh, psychological and medical evaluation as well as a polygraph uh, exam to ensure that all the information that they provided to us is accurate and, and trustworthy, competent, and people with high character values. Um, eventually, they go through a 14-week training program and a year probationary period. So these are the officers that we hire um, 
uh, to be part of this police organization. And these are the same type of officers that have been vetted out to be part of the school resource officers if selected for that. Um, the application process for the school resource officer is, is typically a tenured police officer, a police officer that's been on the department for um, five to 10 years. They have likely have been hand selected by former school resource officers or police supervisors within our police department who think that they would be a good fit based on their communication skills with kids and their past work history. Um, the interview process is consistent with the policy that has been set forth uh, upon the board. And the selection process for these individuals is a collaborative effort between the administration and our police department uh, to ensure that we have the right person that is gonna be for that particular school. Our SROs, when they do become SROs, they go through a, a very uh, comprehensive training. Uh, this training, uh, when they're SROs for about five years, um, it, like I said, is very comprehensive. They have continuous training. Um, I can certainly uh, write off some of the trains that they go for, but if, if you request, I can certainly provide you all the different trainings that the SROs go through uh, to ensure that they are uh, having the best practice for the school district. Some of these trains are ethics in the SRO. Um, SRO is an informal counselor and mentor, adverse childhood experiences, trauma-informed care, adolescent and mental health training, fair and impartial policing, human trafficking in schools, autism awareness for first responders, suicide prevention from youth, vulnerability and homeless youth, understanding the implicit and explicit bias, crisis prevention, crisis intervention and de-escalation, adolescent and behavioral health conditions, drug endangered children, educating youth and the dangers of the internet, multiculturalism training, crisis intervention training, and the list goes on. Um, like I said, I can certainly provide a, a more comprehensive formalized list of the trains that the SROs go through, um, if you wish. Um, the role of the SRO uh, is, is um, some things are very difficult to measure. Um, they build meaningful, positive relationships um, with the students and the administrative staff, um, with the parents, um, and with they typically respond to information and evidence of school threats, drug use, child maltreatment, physical safety of students, fights, harassments, and other forms of conflicts. They serve as mentors, most likely, mostly, and role models, partners with the Department of Human Services for children that are in need. Uh, they facilitate learning academies, such as the Junior Police Academy, which we had a very um, large success rate with. We've served over 250 families through the Junior Police Academy, which is a great opportunity for the officers that are not part of the SROs to get um, familiar with the student body and the student body to get familiar with the SROs. Uh, they work collaboratively with the administration and serve uh, a service of support role. And I think it's important to note that they are not part of the disciplinary process within the school district. They do not patrol the hallways. They do not look for infractions. Um, they're first responders to the critical incidents and first aid care. Uh, prior to EMS arrival, and they provide education and safety through presentations. There's countless numbers of presentations that the SROs do, school safety and security presentations, cyber security and interacting with strangers, criminal law, drug and alcohol presentations, fire drills and intruder drills. And I do believe that the presence of the SROs within the schools do make the schools safer. Uh, they do have these positive interactions with students. They've been working collaboratively with the school district for many years. Uh, I believe our first uh, school resource officer came in 1980. We um, had two resource officers in 1985. And from that point forward, we moved to five school resource officers and had a lot, a lot of positive feedback um, from the resource officers there in the school. I'm, I'm confident to say that our school resource officers are professional communicators. Uh, they've been hand selected. They've proven uh, a very good work history, working out there in the community. And I've also seen the familiarity of these school resource officers after they get out of the schools and they go back on patrol in the streets and the positive interactions that they've had with students. I per personally witnessed uh, many um, kids that have grown older come up to the school resource officer and tell them how much of a positive impact that they have had on them throughout the course of their life. Thank you. Each March, data from the school year is presented to the board. In March of 2020, data and trends from the 2019-20 school year were shared. Principals and resource officers began to examine the data that was disaggregated by the school and identify areas of focus the following year. And then, like many things, 
COVID impacted our plans. Um, in this case, however, COVID has provided uh, opportunities. Fewer students in our schools provided the opportunity for stronger relationships with our school resource officers and the school community as, um, as well. Um, and there has been increased engagement um, face to face with our officers this school year. Um, I'll begin with a review of the data so far during the 2021 school year. Uh, this year in the district, we have five school resource officers who have had 243 contacts with students, staff, and families. And just for sake of comparison, last year at this time, our SROs had approximately 1,350 contacts um, with students. We have examined this year's contacts and would like to share with you who initiated the contact, why students um, were con and SROs contacted one another, which students tended to have contact with their SROs, and what happened um, once that contact with me was made. So before we begin looking at the SRO data, I'd like to pause here um, to talk about pol policy 444. It states that both the district and the Eau Claire Police Department are committed to anti-racism. And our SROs will serve with due regard for racial, cultural, or other differences. In order to measure our work toward this goal, the data that you'll see tonight is disaggregated by race and ethnicity um, throughout the presentation. So this graph does show the race and ethnicity of students um, in our secondary schools. You can see here um, that this is actually for our whole district, I'm sorry. You can see here that approximately 75% um, of our students are white, 10.3% uh, are Asian, 6.2% um, are Hispanic or Latinx, 5.1% two or more races, and 2.6% are Black. Um, before we dive into the demographic data, um, there are a few important things to note. Um, first, each data point re represents a contact. Um, for example, if, if I met with an SRO one time, I would receive one data point. If I talked with an SRO 10 times, I would receive 10 data points. So the data that we're sharing might not reflect necessarily the number of students that had contact, but instead the number of contacts. Um, that the SRO made. Um, second, McKinley data is reported in the overall data, but it, there's such a small number of students at McKinley, um, it would be really easy to identify the students if we reported it out in a disaggregated manner. So for that reason, we did not break out McKinley data on its own. Um, in, in some schools, the cell size of some of the subgroups um, will be really small as well. So again, to protect the identity of students, we may not report all out on all subgroups. Um, and then third, it's important to know that the race and ethnicities reported by the DPI don't match entirely with those uh, reported by the district. So for example, we report Alaskan Native, but the DPI does not. Um, they report Pacific Isle and we do not. So although subgroups don't align 100%, we believe the data will still be um, valuable to, for you to look at. So this graph shows which students um, were connecting with our school resource officers this year. Um, you can see that 57% of all contacts with school resource officers were male students and 43% were female. Um, on the right hand side, you can see that 72% of all contacts were students um, were with students that were white. 10% with students that were Asian, 9% with students that were two or more races, 5% with students that are Black, 3% of contacts were with students who were Latinx or Hispanic, and 1% with Alaskan Native. These graphs show the race and ethnicity of students at our high schools. I wanna remind you that we need to be careful with the data and the cell size of certain groups. Um, for example, at North High School on the right-hand side, um, you will see that um, three students are um, Pacific Isle or identify as Pacific Isle. So if we reported the data that indicated why an SRO had contact with somebody who was um, Pacific Isle or what happened in that contact, it'd be very easy for others to possibly identify who that student might be. 
Um, so because of that, we, um, and in an effort to maintain confidentiality and trust, cell sizes that are lower than 20 um, will not be reported out in a disaggregated manner in this report. These graphs show the distribution of contacts at Memorial on the left and North on the right. Um, one of the things that we look for is to see if the percent of contacts are relatively close to the population at each school. At the same time, remember that if I have several contacts with an SRO, I'm represented in the data several times. Um, so looking at this data, you might notice that white students make up 63.9% of contacts at Memorial. Um, students who are Hispanic or Latinx make up 19.7% of those contacts. Two or more races make up 8.2, Asian 4.9, and those who are Black make up 3.3% of SRO contacts. At North, students who are white account for 77.8% of the contacts. Of the remaining contacts, 8.6 are Hispanic or Latinx, 6.2 um, are 2%, two races or more, and uh, students who are Asian or Black each make up 3.7% of the contacts. Um, for comparison's sake, I'm going to go back to the previous slide so you can see the shape of the graphs. Again, this is north. This, the one on the right is north. The one on the left is memorial. So just to look at the shapes and the shading of those. Go forward. All right, again, you will see here the uh, demographic makeup of our three middle schools. Um, so again, look at the shapes of these graphs um, and the shading of those graphs. I'll give you a moment to look at those as I move forward to the next slide. You'll see what um, school resource um, officer contacts looked like in those schools. At each of the three middle schools, the majority of contacts were made with students who were white. Um, at DeLong, the remaining 26 contacts were with students who were um, black or two or more races. At North Star, 20% uh, of the contacts were with students who were two or more races or Latinx. And at South Middle School, um, there's more of a distribution among several races and ethnicities within the remaining um, contacts that they had. So as we start to dig deeper into the data, the first data point that we collect is who initiates the contact, um, the school resource officer contact within the school. Overwhelmingly, you can see here that the majority of contacts are initiated by students and school staff. In fact, 49% of the contacts with school resource officers were initiated by school staff and 30% were initiated by students. In contrast, 4% um, of them were initiated by law enforcement. It's also helpful to consider why students and school resource officers connect. The contacts can be categorized as a proactive contact, student welfare, um, criminal investigation, um, an ordinance violation, or other. Um, two important things that um, you do not to note here are um, the impact of COVID on the interactions this year. Um, you can see that 28% of our contacts this year were related to, to child welfare. Um, student welfare during the 2019-20 school year, just to compare, 12% of our SRO contacts were related to student welfare. Um, second, our goal is that 50% of contacts with school resource officers are proactive in nature. Um, so this graph, you can see that 23% of the contacts were um, categorized as proactive. But many of those student welfare contacts are also, um, they have a proactive bend to them. Um, for example, um, in those contacts, uh, school resource um, officers documented cases about um, so social media usage, um, students that were reported as runaways, um, or what are the laws um, against um, some of the things that they do in their neighborhood.
And here we take uh, uh, the district-wide data and we break it out by gender on the left and race and ethnicity on the right. So these are the same contacts that um, we saw, the same reasons for the contacts, but we break them out by gender um, and race and ethnicity. So because 70, or I'm sorry, 57% of the contacts were with males, we would expect the bars um, um, for male versus female, we would expect the bars for the males to be higher because overall they had more contacts um, with the SROs than the females did. Um, and then if you look at the graph on the right with the um, purpose by race or ethnicity, you can look for trends about um, races that um, might have more proactive contacts or more student welfare checks versus those that may have more criminal investigations or ordinance violations. And then these graphs um, break down that same data by level. Um, again, it's important that we respect the privacy of students. So you'll notice that, as I mentioned previously, there are some um, groups that we won't report out for in this graph just due to the small cell sizes. Um, on the left, you can see data around why middle school students connected with our SROs um, by race and then and ethnicity. And then on the right, you can see that same data for high school. And then after each contact with families, um, students and staff, our SROs document the disposition or the result of that conversation. So you can see here that SRO contacts can lead to an arrest or, or a referral, and that did happen 43 times this year. Um, it's important to recognize, though, that 83% of the time, uh, our SROs facilitated counseling or education about the law. They mentored students. They initiated referrals for wraparound support from community agencies or recommended school-based consequences. Um, our SROs do understand adolescence. They understand child development and uh, support students in the mission of the district um, in their interactions. Again, this data tells part of the story here. Um, we'd like to disaggregate the data uh, by demographic and by school. And so I'd like to share that with you now. So if we dig into that a little bit more, these graphs illustrate um, the, those dispositions by gender on the left. And on the right, you can see that same information broken down by middle school and high school. So um, male MS is male middle school, female MS is female middle school, and then the same thing for high school. So district-wide on the left, and by level on the right. And then here you'll see the dis distribution of disposition um, by race and ethnicity um, at our middle school and high school levels. So middle school on the left, um, and high school on the right. One way to analyze these graphs is to, again, look for the representation of a race or ethnicity across multiple dispositions. For example, um, were students of two or more races represented in law and counsel, mentoring and juvenile referral? Um, another way to analyze it is to look at the size of the um, color in each bar in relation to the proportion of students in that demographic group. Um, for example, um, the majority of our contacts were with students who were white, so it makes sense that the bars for our white students are higher than for the other groups. Um, I want to stress here that we, we recognize the importance of this data, um, and more importantly, we recognize the work that needs to come after the data. Again, um, this year I will share this data um, with each school, and principals and school resource officers will examine the school level data. Um, and then they'll develop action plans that are specific um, to their school. My hope is that next year at this time, I'd be able to share those action plans with you as well as the impact that those plans have on our data.
And so now we'll transition into the second requirement within the policy, and that is to review the policy annually. This policy, um, like I said before, is scheduled to be reviewed at Policy and Governance um, later this week. And at that time, I, I do plan to share the, the research that I referenced earlier, but I'd also like to share two recommendations for Policy and Governance um, around this policy. The first recommendation is for um, PNG to clearly delineate the role of the school resource officer so that ECASD staff and administrators are able to distinguish between disciplinary conduct, um, which is handled by school administrators and staff, and illegal conduct, which would be handled by law enforcement in the school. Um, certainly, we value the role of, that SROs play um, in our school, but we also recognize that the vast majority of student behavior in our schools can and should be the responsibilities of our teachers, our counselors, and our administrators. So having those clearly delineated roles um, we feel would, would be helpful um, for all of our stakeholders. The second recommendation um, that we would propose is to make um, within the policy um, clear um, guidelines regarding the data that the board would like to be collected and how it would like for that data to be reported. So as an example, if I, um, if I simply take the 243 contacts that we had this year and then multiply it by the number of factors within each of those contacts, the gender of students, the race and ethnicity of students, who initiated the contact, um, what was the outcome? What was the contact about? There are actually over 300,000 data points um, for a very slow year in the SRO world. Um, so Deputy Chief Thomas and I really wanna make sure that the data that we share is helpful to you. Um, we've collected the data um, outlined that you see in this policy, but we know that you have additional questions um, and we know you've had those questions in the past. So if this section of the policy were revisited um, and we could clearly identify what it is that the board is um, asking with the data analysis, we think that um, that would be very helpful um, for you as we examine um, trends moving forward. And then finally, policy 445 requires um, that the memorandum of understanding is reviewed annually. The current uh, MOU is in place from January 17th to July, or I'm sorry, June 30th, 2022. It does outline that five, the five schools that you see listed here, DeLong, North Star, South Memorial and North um, have SROs. Um, although they do serve all of the schools in our district. Um, the MOU also indicates the pay structure um, for those school resource officers. We don't have recommendations um, for changing the MOU at this time. However, as the policy is reviewed, it might impact future um, MOUs. Deputy Chief Thomas, would you like to speak? Sure, thank you, Kim. Mm -hmm. um, the partnerships that we've had with the Oak Bay Area School District have been invaluable for, for us and, and I believe the school district. Uh, the multiple SROs that we've had throughout the course of the years have shown to have a profound positive impact, uh, meaningful relationships that they've had with the student body as well as the administrative staff. And I mentioned it before that you know our, our SRO, SRO uh, SROs, um, they do not uh, patrol um, the hallways. They do not purposely go out and look for infractions. They are merely a resource for the student body. They assist the administrative staff. They support the administrative staff. They develop positive relationships with kids. Um, they have uh, a go-to person within the school that's uh, easy access that they're familiar to, um, that the officer uh, has um, good familiarity of their behaviors and be able to act accordingly. That's um, that's both beneficial for the school district and, and the police department. And they develop and they are their mentors uh, to these kids. If like it or not, some of these kids uh, are having problems at home and those, those problems filter into the schools. Um, so to have that familiarity with the students and to be able to talk to that student and have that positive relationship with the administrative staff as well as the parents is very helpful. Um, there have been critical incidents that happen outside of school that do involve students. 
uh, the partnership that Kim and I, we've worked together for a few years now on some critical incidents um, that has happened to the students. And we've always been consistently on the same page to where the families are notified first of the incident before the general population is notified of the incident and, and what's the ultimate outcome. So to have that uh, go-to person that's uh, readily available for the administrative staff that they can trust, that they've handpicked, is critical, uh, especially when we're dealing with some of the incidents that have happened with inside the school walls and outside the school walls. Um, the SROs, they don't, they don't deal with um, uh, some of the, the minor infractions that kids might do outside of school. Um, the bigger ones, obviously the more critical ones, they, they do get involved in. Um, they do work alongside the administrative staff as well. Um, over the years, like I said, you know, I talked a little bit about the police, uh, Junior Police Academy. That's been very a, a very positive thing. Um, we've been receiving inquiries from families already, uh, whether or not they can have their children sign up for the Junior Police Academy. Like I said, we've served over 250 families so far. We've been recognized uh, with alongside the school district in collaboration of a 2009 National Recognition Award for Safety Programs from the School Safety Advocacy Council. And in 2011, um, the school district as well as the police department received a national recognition for anti-bullying and awareness campaign. So these, these partnerships have been going on for a long time. But they're, they've been shown to be valuable. The, like I said, the familiarity with our officers and the students, not just when they're in school, but when they're outside of school and then when they grow up into adults, a positive interaction context. And I will um, piggyback that, especially from a communication standpoint, um, the partnership with the Eau Claire Police Department um, is um, very valuable when we have incidents, whether in school or in the community. For example, I do know that, um, you know, in the midst of a crisis, during the crisis and after the crisis, we will have a coordinated response with our, um, the information that um, we share and we'll have streamlined communication. Um, also having, um, uh, an SRO available, uh, for example, um, you know, when something happens at school, um, it is a resource that that we do rely on. Most importantly, though, I think it's the, the proactive um, stance that school resource officers take in the relationship building with students um, that we value the most, which is why we always strive for at least 50% of the contacts to be proactive. So I'll, I'll review. Um, there are three annual requirements outlined within policy 445. Um, you can see the recommendations for those requirements here. Um, after reviewing the policy, we are recommending um, that the incidents for school and school resource officer investigations are clearly defined and the data collection process um, is um, also reviewed. Number two, um, although there are no revisions to the MOU at this point in time, if the policy is updated or when the policy is updated, we would recommend a, a review of that MOU um, and potential changes to that. And then finally, we um, shared data with you tonight. And based on that review, we're at, um, recommending some action steps. One, share the data with school principal, with principals and school resource officers. Uh, we believe it would be helpful for principals to see not only the district-wide data, uh, but the disaggregated data for their schools. And number two, that the principal and SROs each develop a plan to address any needs or gaps that they see within their data um, so that they can set a goal and positively impact that data. And then number three, that those results will be shared with the board at the annual meeting next year at this time. And so we would like to open it up to questions and discussions at this time. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Deputy Chief Thomas, for bringing this information to us today. Uh, I will open the floor now to comments and questions from board members. Dr. Johnson. Uh, yeah, thank you for uh, for this presentation. Uh, I think in, in light of uh, uh, recent events, uh, uh, SRO roles in education have been uh, examined not only in our state but across the country. And I have, you know, I, I, I have a, a load of questions, but I also will be bringing some of those to PNG as it relates to Policy 455. But to to uh, kind of start the discussion, just uh, uh, I, as a board member, I I request if you could provide uh, 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 Mr. Thomas, if you could provide that documentation of the training. Uh, the specific uh, training for the five SROs. I would uh, uh, appreciate that report. 
could you uh, just give me a, 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 a quick breakdown of just the, what's the demographics of our five SROs as it pertains to gender and or, uh, and or race? Um, and then could you speak to uh, these training, these documented training, what's the alignment of those trainings to requirements that have been outlined uh, by that National Association of uh, School Resource Officers, NASRO, I think the acronym, mm -hmm. uh, the, the acronym is, and, and, and where are we in terms of our alignment of some of their uh, quote unquote best practices recommendations that came out in, uh, in 2018. Um, and I, I'll guess I'll stop there uh, and then I'll, I, I'll, I'll come back. But if you could have just addressed those pieces, thank you. Sure, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Um, I'll, I'll start with the first one. In the back end of it, you were breaking up a little bit, so I might have to ask you to, to, to repeat uh, the request. But yeah, our five SROs in, in speaking in terms of demographics, we do have, they're all uh, five white males. Um, they're five white males um, right now. Um, I, I do know that we have a younger generation of quality uh, police officers that are interested in becoming SROs that can break up those demographics a little bit more to better serve the student body. Um, I have uh, had supervisors that have had discussion with those and do know that there is um, interest in those transitions when, when they're available. They are young uh, at this time and certainly are more than capable to be successful in that position. As far as, far as the training is concerned, um, it's training that these SROs have gotten, um, they're, they're na nationally recognized training. They do go to a SRO basic conference that's 40 hours long that cover a wide range of uh, topics that are beneficial for the SROs to better serve the student body, to better understand trauma-informed care, uh, mental health uh, crisis awareness for for, for the kids and obviously, you know, their role as an SRO working with the administrative staff as a support role and not a disciplinary or disciplinary role. Rather, they are involved in only criminal investigations. Um, their primary responsibility is to be a lead mentor, um, a person to trust, you know, that familiar face that ultimately turns into a person of trust that they can come to. Uh, as a third party person within the building. And I'm sorry, the back end of the questions broken up a little bit or did yeah, I just the, Yeah, just the uh, alignment with that, uh, uh, the, the 2018 uh, NASRO uh, best practices document. And so have, have the training for those SROs, have, have you aligned in communication with the school district with those best practices? Because in that document, they made it a point of realizing that the uh, uh, kind of the uh, uh, the quote unquote political climate and our uh, school environment climate uh, between SROs, uh, community, especially communities of color. I'm just curious as to who, where does the determination come in terms of the updated of expectations of training and so i i my, my hopes are that it's just not a a, a one-time thing to uh, be selected and then go through training but then no other trainings take place and so just could you just speak to that uh, uh that aspect of it thank you as far as the 2018 training of national that you're speaking of i, I must admit i'm new in my position i've only been here a year so I, I i'll need to follow up on that for you sir um, and I will follow up and I'll make sure that, you know, our SROs are highly trained and equipped with that's the best with national standards. We just don't stop with and think that we're just doing fine right now. We're always going to continue to build upon, build upon best practices and look for what's best practices nationally recognized training for our school resource officers. So we just simply just don't settle. But as far as the national is concerned, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't answer that question right now because I'm not familiar with it. I will familiarize myself with it and uh, I'll have those answers. So Dr. Johnson, I know you, you said that you had more questions. I will come back around to you once we've given our other members a chance. Dr. Vika. 
Thank you. I also want to thank you for the report. Um, I find I am um, this year probably more than than ever really struck by the the choice of data to present. Um, so to make the point that the SRO is is really not part of the disciplinary process, but so many of the data points circle back around to discipline in one form or another. Uh, and then a claim that the SROs have a profound positive impact, the relationships, the role models, the mentors. But I, we've not really talked about those data. Where, where are those data? Um, what shows the significant impact that the SROs have on students' lives? We would need student data, family data, even officer data to be able to demonstrate this claim. And so, like I said, I'm so struck by, I, I don't know if we're asking the wrong questions mm -hmm. or collecting the wrong data, um, but I, but there isn't evidence for the claims to me. Can I respond to that a little bit, Commissioner Bika? Would that be okay? Of course. All right. Um, so I'm going to hold back here. This is directly from policy. Um, so you can see that um, this is the, the piece where I do think it would be helpful for us to outline what data do we want collected. Um, so this is the current data A through D um, that the policy asks us to collect. So um, I anticipate anticipated tonight that there would be questions around the data and what um, what is collected or, or what it is showing or what it's not showing, which is one of the reasons why I think as we review this policy, um, I think one of the things we need to consider is what data are we asking for um, and what data can we report out to you. So um, the, the school resource officers do every time they have contact with a student um, collect one through four. I know um, Deputy Chief Thomas asked them this year to um, also include what was the, um, you know, who asked for the contact or who, um, who set that contact in motion. So that would probably be an E on this um, policy. Um, but I think that um, you and I are probably on the same page there as far as what data are we collecting and and is it giving us the information that we're seeking? Um, so that would be um, one of the reasons for this, this recommendation here for policy and governance. Commissioner, is there? Uh, Kim, could you, um, how, many, how many school counselors and and or social workers and or psychologists do we employ at these five locations where there are also SROs? Um, I'm wondering if Kaying can unmute and answer though that question. Hello, yes, I can. So at the secondary level at the middle schools, we have one and a half at North Star, 2.3 at South, and 3.0 at DeLong Middle School. We only have three social workers at the elementary schools at this time. So that's a 3.0 FTE at the elementary schools. And I think she also mentioned uh, school psychs. Kaying, do you, do you know how yep, many so schools? Yep, school psychs are um, under Michelle Racky. And so oh, yes. I yep, might have an idea, but Michelle would know the exact numbers, sorry. I believe that, uh, unless Jim, you can correct me, I believe each high school has a full-time school psych, and I don't know what the, I don't know what the middle schools have. They should, if I can get the data in a moment, I will get back to you as soon as I can. Thanks. My apologies, I don't think we mentioned the high school counselors. There are five at each of our two high schools for 10 total.
We're, we've confirmed 12 sites. We just have to figure out how they're divided. We'll be right with you. A half time at North Star. And I don't know about DeLong. Oh, um, 0.8 at South and 0.9 at DeLong. Thanks to Michelle Radke and Tim Scootley for that data. So, uh, Kim, in that, in that um, vein of questioning, I guess uh, my curiosity is, um, is how many, you know, I wonder if there's a way for us to look at data points. And I mean, this is something that can be discussed in policy and governance. I, I'm, I'm just thinking out loud here is, is how could we cross reference the data for the contacts with the SROs with the contacts with the school site and counselors and social workers. And I'm wondering if the same students are utilizing uh, both services, one or the other, um, and, and for what type of um, what type of encounter? Um, because I think it speaks to you know uh, social workers and psychologists and counselors are trained for those in they're they're trained to to be those resources for kids um, for many 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 years and um and i have no doubt that the police officers that are serving our students are doing everything in their power to become the the best versions of sros that they could possibly be but they're not social workers or psychologists or counselors um and they're being asked to play that role in a significant form for our students and i i would be interested to see if if our students are somehow or another more comfortable or they're being referred that's the other thing is, is are they being referred for one reason or another someplace within the school, uh, either by a parent or staff member? Um, so I, I would love to see that data at some point. Can you just clarify that um, being referred question? Are, are you asking if they're being referred to school resource officers, counselors, or both? Well, that's I'm wondering when when the the decision is made to go to an SRO, is okay. you know that 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 point of are are they being referred also to a counselor? Are they be giving are they are they being given a choice? Is you know what I mean? Is there some sort of reason why students or staff or parents would be choosing a referral to an SRO as opposed to a psychologist or social worker? Thank you. Commissioner Clements. A, qu a question for um, our SRO team. Given everything that's been going on this year and increased attention to law enforcement in general, um, what kind of messaging or, um, I guess, thoughts are going on from, this, from your city side uh, of your role in terms of how to make sure officers are in um, positions that are um, that put the community at best position rather than putting either residents or officers in positions where um, for lack of better term bad things happen you're speaking on term of prevention yeah, prevention um, training um, what the culture of the department um, that can assist developers or assist officers to develop in, in ways that are, uh, I guess, emo emotionally intelligent, culturally intelligent um, to whatever situations that, that I'm sure are very difficult that you often encounter in, in your work. Um, and and so we've been speaking a lot about the, the district side, um, but we know that you work in a, uh, a city law enforcement ecosystem and so I'm interested to hear more about that side in terms of um, what what training and and um, um, other changes have been happening over the past year or so um, in relation to increased 
um, attention and scrutiny of our law enforcement professionals. Well, thank you for the question. I think it's important to note that we just didn't begin this this training um, within the last year. This is this has been ongoing training that we've had for the police department. It's been on the forefront. Um, we're always searching for nationally recognized training for best practices in policing. This isn't just something that we decided to change within this last year because of uh, the circumstances that we've been faced. Um, our officers are all uh, being trained in crisis intervention training. We developed a crisis intervention team um, that's going to train all of our officers in crisis intervention training. More close to 50% of our officers at this time has been trained in our one week long crisis intervention training. Our team is going to be nationally recognized as a crisis intervention team uh, for the training that they plan on putting on for our officers. So it's a, it's a goal that we have uh, within the next few years to ensure that all of our officers become trained in crisis intervention training. We do have fair and impartial policing. We've been doing that for years. Uh, we develop partnerships with neighborhood associations where we have officers that continuously go and speak at different neighborhood associations, talking about the current trends within particular neighborhoods and familiarizing themselves within the neighborhoods that they police. We want people to know within our community who their officers are that are within that neighborhood. And I think it's important to know that we are we work alongside the community. We're partners with the community. Um, we don't, our war, our officers are not warriors, uh, they're problem solvers, they're communicators, they're people with high character and ethical values. Like I've talked about uh, a little bit earlier on in the presentation about the hiring practices that we have. Now this all begins uh, to ensure that we have a good fundamentally sound police organization and we hire the best people that we can poss possibly hire. Uh, we go through a very strenuous hiring process that takes anywhere from six to eight months. Um, within that six to eight months, these officers are vetted to ensure that they are of high moral character before they are even offered a position within our police department. So the training that we have them go through, we, we can use, this last year has been difficult, I think, as everybody knows with COVID. Um, training has been virtual. We've been resulting to virtual training because obviously with COVID um, kind of getting in the way, our officers aren't able to venture outside the city and, and go to the trains that they typically have gone within the last several years. Um, but we do have them do virtual training, so we're not stopping our training now because of COVID. We continue on educating our officers of the best practices uh, to ensure that they engage with the community um, fairly uh, in the best ways possible. Zoe Wolf. I would just like to say from a student perspective that I don't think that positive, the positive impact of officers can be put into data, if that makes sense. Like, for example, the previous officer at North, Chaz, he would talk to, in the hallway, you would always see him talking to students, and rarely would I see negative interactions, and I was there for two of the years that he worked there. And I just don't think that can be put into data of how students feel about the officers. Yes, you could get surveys, but does that really reflect truly what it's like? And thinking back to elementary school when officers would come in and talk about, you know, stranger safety and crossing the road, things like that. I just think interactions, especially at a young age, that it's good for kids to just be, to just meet police officers because they probably won't get the chance to otherwise unless they were put into a bad situation. But I just think it's really good to at least have the outreach and the opportunity for students to reach out or to meet officers and talk to them without thinking that it's always such a negative thing. So I would just like to say that I like that officers are there. I think it's comforting. And although I have never had a bad experience with an officer, I think a lot of students feel like that as well. Commissioner Harder. Uh, I think Zoe's point about data is a good one. I, we've, I've personally, as a board member, wrestled with uh, similar questions around uh, a lot of our whole child uh, initiatives in the district and how do you measure 
how do you measure things that seem almost un unmeasurable and and we talk about maybe counting interactions and, and and things and surveying and things like that but none of them seem to be quite up to the task um, but it is a I think it's a really important question especially as we look at um, you know uh, coherent governance as a model for this board the data becomes particularly important and uh, what role do these anecdotes play versus what role do, does the hard data play? Um, Kim, when you talk about uh, the matrix of data, and the, I think it was maybe 300,000 data mm -hmm. points. Um, yeah, I appreciate it. I think this is the slide up here uh, that um, there, I think you, the guidance from from staff is going to be really important from our, our our executive team on how to make sense of this data and how to, how to move forward with getting there there are clearly there's clearly work to be done but how how do we measure in such a way that helps us track the progress of that work define the work and pro and, and make progress on it thank you I, I mean ultimately we do want to provide the data that you're seeking um, and the information um, that you would like. So, um, you know, as we ponder that, I suppose that policy and governance, um, there's, you know, probably a few layers of questions related to that that we might need to consider. Dr. Beaker, I see that you are unmuted and I presume it is in direct response to this. So I will, if, if that's the case, I'm happy to recognize you again. Otherwise, we'll continue to wait. Uh, it is, but I don't want to speak ahead of somebody else who hasn't spoken yet, if, if anyone's interested. Sure. Uh, Commissioner Lyons, is, do you have anything this time? Otherwise, I do have uh, plenty for myself. And then Dr. Beaker, we'll, we'll come back to you just like Dr. Johnson. Go ahead, Commissioner. No, by Lyons. all means, Tim. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, for me, uh, you know, Kim, I'm sure you'll remember last year when you came and gave this and uh, I was not particularly impressed by the data in the sense of how minority students, uh, mm -hmm. minorities were overrepresented. I even I went back at one point and looked at the minutes and saw Dr. Vika was also noted as, as having some comments there. And um, I'm not particularly happy with what I'm seeing this year as well. Uh, and I think that it, I'm glad that the data is provided by school because just as schools are a leading indicator for increasing diversity of our community, so are the secondary schools behind the elementary schools in terms of their diversity, right? As our community grows more diverse, the children pump up. So at first, when I looked at the, the data, for example, district-wide for Latinx students, it shows 3%. Hey, they're, they're actually underrepresented in terms of the overall district population. But when you dive into, and you'll have to forgive me, this is going to get a lot of numbers are about to come out of my mouth. And I also want to recognize that we're also working with relatively small populations here. So we don't necessarily have, and, I, and as you said, Kim, you know, if one person has 10 interactions, they're 10 times there. And of course, that makes a bigger difference when it's one out of, say, the 25 listed black students at DeLong than it does for the 735 white students at DeLong. So I recognize that we are talking about things that are able to skew some of this data. But when I dig into our Latinx population, if I looked at just the percentage of contacts at Memorial, 19.7 compared to 7% Hispanic and Latinx oh, students sure. at North, 8.6 percent compared to 4% of actual population. At DeLong, none, so or at least none reported. 6.7% at North Star compared to 5.6% of actual population and 11%, 11.1 uh, to be exact, percent at South compared to 8.4% population. And as I look across our five schools where this data is reported, Blacks, Latinx, and students identifying as two or more races are overrepresented in the contacts with SROs at Memorial, at North, 
Blacks and two or more students are overrepresented at Geelong. Latinx students are uh, slightly overrepresented at North Star, as are and two or more race students. And at South, all three of those groups are overrepresented. And I went on to look at, uh, and I, so I did a bunch of number crunching this afternoon, and I, because I wanted to look not only at what's happening now, but also what happened last year. Because last year when we talked about this, mm -hmm. what we heard was, there's a lot of baseline data. This is the first year we're disaggregating. And this is, of course, what we want is to disaggregate. But we didn't see that, you know, what's the, the two step over time. So the first question I asked was, how does this compare to white students? So what are my, what's my contact? And so I, I did some, some just, well, I mean, it was on the spreadsheet, but it was quick math, right? Latinx students at Memorial are 3.54 times more likely to be have a contact with an SRO than their white peers. Blacks are 1.66 times, and two or more races, 2.65. Right? We're going to see similar. There's similar numbers. Um, DeLong blacks are 4.76 times more likely to have contact with an SRO than their white peers. Now, this is the case. There's 25 students there. So one student that had a really bad year or a really great year and was just always down there talking with that, like as Zoe mentioned, there's, there are, I'm sure, relationships being built and that can skew it, right? At South, Blacks, 2.46 times more likely than their white peers. Hispanics, 1.4, two or more races, 1.75. I, I can send a little color-coded picture that I have sitting in front of me so I don't miss any of that. But I also thought, well, Last year was baseline data. We weren't happy about it then. If we see a broad, you know, trending back to everybody having basically their own representation, you know, one to one. So if I'm 3.3% of the population, I'm 3.3% of the context. But there's not that either. And so I compared that look. Now, so at Memorial, blacks are less likely this year compared to last year to have contact with SRO. So that trend is getting closer to the representative. Group. But Hispanics are more likely this year. Mm -hmm. And so are people of two or more races. At North, those three groups are trending back towards the mean. I'm not including Asian groups here because Asians, if, if anything, are underrepresented compared to their populations. And so, uh, but we could look at those as well. Uh, at DeLong, two out of those three are coming back in the direction towards pop, but you know, blacks, black contact is up uh, at North Star. Latinx is up where two or more races are down. Blacks are not reported at North Star because there are, uh, there's a very low black population there. And at South, it's up for blacks and Latinx students and slightly down. So we, there are plenty of points where it's, we're moved, at least for this one year trend, we've moved closer to representative contact, but there's also plenty of points where we're moving away from it. And that's a real problem to me because if we can't say that we're moving closer to our goal, then we're not, what are we doing? What is our goal? And you might be able to say, well, we're having positive contacts. And so many of these contacts with these students are positive ones. We're shooting for 50% proactive contacts or you know, whatever our goals are. But I would ask, why do black and Latinx students, why do students of two or more races need more positive contacts than their white? Years. Why are they overrepresented in positive context if you want to call them positive even? So this is a real issue for me, and I, I don't know what to make of it. This is a two-year item, but when, we're, when we just tonight signed this equity agreement and we're overrepresenting the same sort of trends that we see in policing nationwide, and don't get me wrong, I think that there are a lot of positives that might come out of this. But when we're overrepresenting our students of color, there's some there's racism going on, and that's not acceptable. And so I'm not certain what the what the measure is. I know some districts in the in the state have removed their SROs entirely, and I think there's a reasonable question to be asked about how many of these SRO functions are better handled, as Commissioner Zur said, by professionals who are trained entirely in this. That are you know the mentoring that can happen. Is it better handled by a social worker, by a psychologist, by a counselor? I was very disappointed to hear my son refer, and this is anecdotal, to hear my son tell me, I can't go to my counselor, they're only there for scheduling. And he's a memorial. So 
why why can't he go if he's you know he recently lost his grandfather if he's feeling down he feels he can't go to the counselor at memorial but isn't that the person isn't that one of the people that should be able to take care of that and if we're handing that off to police and we're overrepresenting our populations of color in those handoffs i have a lot of concerns and i'm not sure how to rec you know and I, we'll we'll take this up in png but uh, these numbers are problematic and they're not overall better from last year. So I don't think we've taken that step. So the trainings are great, but if they're not producing results that show us that we're contacting these students, and again, with the caveat, that these are small populations and they can be skewed by you know, a few students who have a lot of contact. I don't have a direct question, but I'm really troubled for the second year in a row by, the, by this data. Dr. Johnson, and then Commissioner Zuri, you'll be up next. Yeah, could could you could you speak to like I, you know, I'll I'll finish up with my remaining questions and I'll leave the rest of them for Thursday and and P and G. But could you, I I I'm, for me, what I'm a little bit troubled by is that you know one of the outcomes is like school based discipline. My the idea school based discipline should not actually be part of an SRO report mm -hmm. because it actually should be part of the educator and administrator's report. Uh, and, and so, but I also wanted to uh, do we have data? Do we know if those uh, uh, those students, some of these students, regardless of, of race, also would be categorized as uh, students with uh, IEP plans and or behavior management uh, plans as well? And so I'm. I'm just curious if we could potentially get information there, and then uh, I, I look back in the I, I look back in the policy uh, 455, and I guess I'm trying to find some operational definitions. Could you operationally define uh, proactive, and like, is it proactive for whom? Like, like, what does it like? What does pro proactive mean? How is that operationalized by our SROs? And then uh, that that last piece that I, I I thought was a little bit interesting. On the bottom of uh, our policy 455, we have this uh, school legal resource manual as uh, uh, as an attachment, uh, uh, and I, I guess it's supposed it's supposed to support um, our, uh, our our policy. However, there's a lot of things that have actually changed since 2016, uh, especially mm -hmm. in terms of best practices. And I would actually argue, especially as it relates to our SRO interview process that's in there does not actually align with the school legal resource manual process that's uh, uh, that's uh, uh, put there. So I, I think we have to do, but could you just, are students with disabilities, are we able to get any of that information as part of it or, 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 or no? And that's kind of what I'm, and like I said, I think for me moving forward in terms of that progress that uh, 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 Dr. Nardine was speaking to, I think really that, that school-based discipline piece I, once again, I would just argue I'm not even sure that should even be a part of an outcome that's actually being reported from, uh, from from an SRO because if we say that what we're actually saying then is SROs play a specific role in classroom management issues within the school and so when you you that recommendation that you have on there I think it this one has to really be be spelled out in terms of because what that would also do in terms of uh, 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 providing us some level of progress, we would hope then that actually that the slide that was presented to us about the percentages of who's making this contact, that we see a, uh, uh, a decreased percentage in both the teacher, and I was a little bit shocked about the, the administrator piece. You know, it's that, you know, that administrators of each building, if administrators with, uh, at each building are not, uh, 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 the best in terms of proactive measures of behavior management, then we actually have to examine actually our training for actually those building leaders. And so, you know, what, I guess the only question if you want to ask now, and like I said, I'll, I'll have these ready to go on Thursday, but could you just speak to that students with disability piece mm -hmm. and uh, are we able to actually have some of that data included? Thank you. Um, we can um, look at, um, we would be able to dig into Skyward and, and find out whether a student um, does or does not have either an IEP or a 504. 
um, plan, we do not have that. I do not have that data now, so it would take you know some some time to go in and, and check that. Um, as far as the school-based discipline, that is um, one of the reasons for the recommendation that you see here. Like we need to clearly delineate those roles um, and, and understand um, when, it, when is it school-based um, and when should an SRO um, be involved. So um, that is the exact reason for this recommendation here. I also, um, heard you ask what proactive means and and Derek I wonder if you wanted to talk about that at all yeah the the certain column that I had added to uh, the data collection um, from the school resource officers this year is, is to how the actual student has been contacted the reason as to why were they contacted were they contacted because a student were they contacted because a teacher were they contacted because an administrator a parent um, and we found out that a vast majority of their contacts are not uh, based on the proactive efforts of the school resource officer. Um, the proactive piece, as I'm looking through some of this data that has been presented to me from the school resource officers, was if, uh, for example, an unruly student uh, may be in, in the lunch line where a teacher tries to intervene and the incident uh, becomes rising to the level to where the presence of a police officer might help de-escalate that situation, but not result in an arrest or a citation because those are always the last resort uh, for our officers. The last resort that they want to do is implement intermediate sanctions on a student. The first thing they want to do is to, like I said, help uh, collaborate with the administrative staff if needed to help with the administrative staff and have them referred to certain outside entities to get them the proper need and care that they are proper care that they need. So the proactive efforts are with the officers um, seeing that a situation is perhaps rising to the level to where their presence can help de de escalate the situation because of being the presence of a police officer. Commissioner, is there? Yeah, so I I um, I also have a, a few pages in a notebook, um, same where I did number crunching of the of the same magnitude today, and and one of my questions was going to be about long term data collection. Um, just as a new board member, I don't ha I I didn't have the presentation last year, and I think that going forward, it would be helpful to make sure that we can see progress over time, um, and especially any areas of improvement and any areas where um, there has not been any improvement. Um, I, I too am left with a lot of questions specifically related to this delineation of roles. And I, I'm gonna propose a question and whether it's a reasonable one or not, I don't know. But what our, what, what are our students, social workers and counselors and psychologists doing with their time? If they are not available, to actually be resources for our kids in school. Is, is there something that they are doing um, as part of their job description uh, that, that we need to, to think about? Um, because it, this, this comes back to a question to me of, you have a teacher or an administrator who gets themselves in a situation with a student where they need some support and they're, they think of the people that they have at their disposal, and SRO is the one that they send that student to, or the SRO is the person that they go to. Why is that? What is it that the SRO is providing to that student that a social worker or a school counselor who should have been building those relationships since even before that student entered that that building, that school as a student, right? At orientations, like this is where you're meeting these people. They should be in your life every day. It should be part of your experience. Sometimes counselors are the only consistent staff person a student has from the minute they enter middle school to the minute they leave. That person should be really important. And I think that the only reason there, there, there begs a question of why. Why is it the SRO that they get sent to? Why is it the SRO that gets called? 
And the only thing I can think about is for some reason, it's a judgment against the student or it's a need for some sort of intimidating presence. And that makes me very, very nervous. So I think it's that delineation of roles and how we support our students and how we refer them. The question, it, it begs to be asked there. Commissioner Harder, I, I see you there, but I, I did uh, tell Dr. Bika I'd get back to her and then forgot to put her right in the slot behind Dr. Johnson. So I'll go Dr. Bika, give you the, an opportunity first and then I'll come to you, Commissioner Harder. That's fine. Please allow Commissioner Harder to speak first. Sure. Thanks, yeah, just a brief comment. I mean, this is, again, I think it's related to the question of data and, and governance. You know, we, we've defined this job a certain way and I can only begin to imagine how difficult this job is um, as we've defined it, whatever the problems are with the way it's been defined. Uh, and I just want to take a moment to acknowledge that and, and express my gratitude for, for our staff and for our SROs for, for doing this, what is undoubtedly difficult work. Um, but, you know, when we see these numbers, I think to different degrees, I think we're all troubled by them for good reason. Um, and, and then the question I'm left with again is, okay, so what does it mean? And I think we keep referring to PNG. To me, that's the right answer is how do we restructure this? And it's a, it seems to me it would be a very fraught question, but um, I think it's an important one for us to, to engage with. Dr. Bika. So I, I know um, several of the officers uh, too, I had as students in class and one I'm very proud to say ended up as an SRO in our district. And so when you ask um, why would kids go to see an SRO, I have a pretty good reason. Um, the one I know is an amazing guy. Um, I have, for me, um, I guess I have a request. Uh, I. I'm a psychologist, and so to, in my world, everything can be measured, and the national data are there. And so I, I wonder if rather than simply doing a, a policy revision, we go back to some of the activity that we did in 2018, but extend. It. So uh, in 2018, an important part of the revision uh, were focus groups with community and family members and students and we could employ focus groups again, uh, but the data are there, the national data are there. So uh, the extension I would love to see would be, um, would be if it be uh, PNG members or a subcommittee to uh, look very closely at the research data. We, we don't have to wait any longer for local data because the data are there. And then consider um, not just in a revision, um, a revision, but also consider an alternative model. And in deline delineating roles, um, that alternative model would be, we do not have SROs in the schools, but we can conceptualize a different way for a relationship with um, Eau Claire Police in our schools. So I, I, if that's possible, I'd say just, um, you know, look at some radically different proposals that PNG would bring forward and then make a decision based on the national data. Kim, I think you mentioned at the beginning of your presentation that you would be bringing to PNG data, at least from around the state and nation about what has been going on. Is that, did I understand that correctly? Yes, I've started to gather some research and some data. I think, Dr. Bika, perhaps some of what you're referring to as far as the impact data. Um, the DPI has posted some information on their website, so I have that and I'll be prepared to 
to share that information with you as well. Um, Marissa is going to work on um, doing a little bit of research around um, what's happening in districts, comparable districts across the state of Wisconsin as far as their relationships with SROs. Um, and we hope to have that by Thursday as well. Thank you. I will agree with you, Dr. Bika, that I think we do have the data we can and what data we need, we can find or use those focus groups to gather. And I think that looking at uh, not taking anything off the table right now and instead being creative with our adjustments is uh, appropriate. So I will take that to P&G and, and carry that there as well. Are there additional comments at this time or questions? Seeing none, I'll thank you once again, Kim. Thank you, Deputy thank you. Chief Thomas. You know, I know that that sometimes, you know, that's the point is to try to get at this data and to, um, I don't want it lost that we appreciate your being here and the work that your department is doing. We just, we know that it is not complete. And I think you would agree that that, that work is never complete for any of our organizations. So I just want to express our thanks for joining us tonight. We'll now move on to our final agenda item of the evening, that is the health and dental insurance renewal rates. I think Abby is probably at least sharing, but I don't know, Abby, if you are presenting or if it's as listed in the, pro, in the PDF, Ms. Lewison. Yeah, Abby, I believe, is sharing, and this is Tanya Lewison. I'm with USI Insurance Services. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having us. Um, I do have my colleague Susie Hoig is also on the line with us, so just wanted to take a moment to introduce her. I have worked with the district for the past three years and presented to this group in the past, and Susie has now joined our team um, so that she can assist going forward. So just wanted to make sure we made that introduction. Hello, everyone. Um, as Tanya said, I'm a consultant that will be working with Eau Claire. I have been with ABRC slash USI for six years, worked with a carrier prior to that, and worked in HR in the school district prior to that. So kind of full circle of with the school district and HR. So I look forward to working with your team. All right, with that, thank you, Susie. And we're gonna go ahead and take a look at your health insurance and dental renewal tonight. So if you want to go ahead, Abby, and flip to the next slide, that'd be great. So we know we have a few new board members, so I want to make sure that we kind of bring you a historical perspective and then bring you into where we are today. So for your historical perspective, we're looking at your renewal for last year, the 2020-21 renewal. So that renewal calculated at a 15.2% increase. Uh, through negotiations with your health carrier security health plan, that renewal increase was delivered at a 9.9 .9 increase, so they did bring that down. At the time that your renewal was calculated, you had a medical loss ratio of 108%. So that 108% is a reflection of your claims coming in and your premium. So what they are looking at at that point is Security Health Plan is paying $1.08 in claims out the door while you're paying a dollar in in premium. So they're basically paying more out than they're taking in in premium. The other piece that's not reflected in a loss ratio are pieces like the administrative expense. So for security to keep the doors open and make sure that they can have people there to answer the phones, process claims, things like that, their administrative expenses run at about 10%. So just wanted to point that out that that is not included in your medical loss ratio. So now we will take a look at your 21-22 renewal. So your plan renews on July 1st. Your renewal this year was calculated at 12.5%. Uh, we all know that with budgets being what they are and the year that we've all had, um, the last 12 months, that 12.5% was absolutely not feasible. Uh, so we worked to negotiate with Security Health Plan to bring that renewal down. They did deliver an increase of 7%. So at the time that that calculation was made, your medical loss ratio had improved. 
So remember the year before we were looking at 108%, we've now dropped to 101.3. So that is a positive thing that you're going kind of in the right direction. So the things that we wanna point out here when they're calculating your increase, uh, they are looking not only at those administrative expenses that we talked about, but they're also looking at medical trend. So medical trend is looking at, if you have an office visit today, they know how much it's gonna cost, but medical expenses continue to go up. So if we're looking at something a year, year and a half from now, what is that same visit gonna cost? So medical trend is right now at approximately 6%. So what you have today will be about 6% more, you know, further down the road. The other adjustment that is being made uniquely this year, not, has not been made in the past, is an adjustment for COVID. So we've all been living it, um, but the underwriters are a little bit concerned about delayed care. So if you have a member in your group that maybe was supposed to have a, a knee replacement, a hip replacement, some type of surgery, maybe they had cancer, and they delayed care for a period of time because of COVID, they are looking at what that extra cost might be. So did they do additional damage? Has the cancer spread further? Those types of things. Because it can cause that cost to rise um, when they come back in and have those services treated at a later time. So that's being added on all carriers that Susie and I work with. They're all adding some type of adjustment for COVID going forward, at least for the 2021 renewals. So tonight we wanted to bring you three options to consider. We're gonna to try to carefully walk through each of the three so that you have a very good understanding. So the first option is option A. So A is essentially looking at your current plan design. It's renewing the current plan, making no changes to the benefit plan. Um, that is an estimated cost increase of the 1.6 million or the 7% that we described. So again, option A is your renewal, no plan design or benefit changes to the plan, and the increase at 1.6. Option B would include a change to your current lab and x-ray benefit. So in order for you to understand that, we'll talk about where you are now. So currently labs and x-rays, if an individual goes in, any lab and x-ray that they have, no matter where the service is offered, is covered at 100% under your plan. If you would move to this selection, any of those services, labs and x-rays that are not done, um, and we'll talk about the clinic in a minute, but any services that are done would be subject to your deductible and your coinsurance. So they would have out-of-pocket expense on those services. Now you're gonna see the notation here that says this is not a standard benefit. So Security Health Plan did offer this on their plans up until about six years ago. So your plan was allowed to keep it essentially in a grandfather type capacity so you could continue that benefit as long as you have it. It's not standardly offered and has not been so for about six years. Now, we were made aware of something this afternoon, so we want to bring this to you in full disclosure so that you understand um, how this plan may impact employees. You do have the near site clinic, so the employee clinic does provide free lab draws and x-ray services. So someone can go to the clinic, have their blood drawn for a lab, they can have their x-ray performed. There's another component to that. So when you have a lab drawn or you have an x-ray taken, someone has to process that lab or they have to read the x-ray. So that portion of the expense is not included at the clinic. They are processed offsite at another location. So those particular items would be subject to the plan deductible and coinsurance. The estimated cost increase on this is 1.2 million. It's about 5.4%. When we offered this option and we were talking about it initially, we were hoping that it would drive people to use the near site clinic. So we want to get as much value out of that or return on your investment as possible. Um, so we were hoping it would drive, you know, patients to use that near site clinic. We're a little bit concerned because of that division where they have certain services covered and now you have readings and processing happening, you know, somewhere else and those are subject to deductible that it may cause some confusion. So we just wanted to bring that to your attention. So option B again, keeps everything else on the planet the same, except for that lab and x-ray 
now covered at 100% and it would be subject to the deductible and the coinsurance. Option C. So option C combines two things, takes your lab and x-ray service that we talked about in option B, has it subject to deductible and to coinsurance, and it also increases the maximum out-of-pocket. So a maximum out-of-pocket is kind of that ceiling. So if you combine all your out-of-pocket expense, whether it be deductible, coinsurance, co-pays, all that money that you spend out of your pocket, and it creates kind of a, a ceiling for that member knowing that when I hit that, my insurance company is going to start paying 100%. So right now, that maximum out-of-pocket or ceiling is at $6,000 for an individual and $12,000 for a family. Now keep in mind that $12,000 would cover also an employee spouse or employee child. So anything other than single is going to have that $12,000. And that would move to $6,500 for single and $13,000 for family. Again, the employee clinic would continue to provide the free lab draws and the x-ray services, but this would have the same challenge in option B where those services would be split, some paid 100% and some would be applied to deductible. The estimated cost increase there is about 1.1 million. Okay, so for your reference, we wanted to give you the full premium. So this is a rate comparison showing your 2021 rates for single, employee plus spouse or plus child, and family rates. And then we also displayed here option A, which again is your renewal with no changes. Option B, changing the lab and x-ray benefit only. And option C, which changes the lab and x-ray benefit as well as increasing that maximum out-of-pocket. So a 7%, 5.4%, and 4.8% respectively. So next we wanted to share with you the impact to employees. So when we're looking at the employee contributions to these plans, we wanted to lay out what that difference looks like for an employee. So you'll see monthly employee contributions are displayed here. With your current premium, we'll just use the family plan as an example. So current premium, your family plan, they're paying $266 a month. With your renewal, option A, no changes, that would move from 266 to 284. With option B, the lab and x-ray change, it changes that from your renewal, about $4, so $280. And option C, which makes two changes, the lab and x-ray and the maximum out-of-pocket change, would move that to $279. So it gives you some perspective on the changes. So renewal, $284, drops it by about $4 for option B and about $5 for option C. At the bottom of the slide, you're going to see the annual district increase from current. So you know your current premium, option A, is going to increase that on the district's portion by about $1.45 million, option B, $1.1 million, and option C, just under $1 million. And that would be your increase from what you pay today. So to round out the picture for you this evening, we wanted to share with you the total cost per month and then per year. I think Abby's having challenges changing here. <laughs> I think we need to, there we go. So your current total cost is at the top. So that's showing you your monthly, what you're paying today. So what you're paying currently is just over 2 million. And you'll see that carries across. And then we're doing projected total costs with the three options. You'll then see the difference. So what's the difference between your projected and your current? And then we broke out the bottom into the employee portion of the increase and the district portion. So again, the employee portion of the increase is overall, this would increase option A would increase the employee portion um, for all employees you know, as a whole, about $17,000. The increase to the district is about 121,000. And then we carried that to the bottom to give you a per year perspective. 
So again, the difference of 1.6 that we talked about earlier, the 1.2, 1.1, and then way at the bottom, correlating back to our district portion of the increase. So you have the 1.4 million option A as the renewal, 1.1 for option B with the lab and x-ray change, and just under 1 million for option C, which has the lab x-ray change, as well as the out-of-pocket increase. So we have met with your holistic committee. Uh, I know that it's been valuable in the past to gain their perspective on things. Uh, they met this afternoon and the decision that was arrived at is that option A seemed to make the most sense. Uh, there was expressed confusion over B and C as far as that lab benefit goes where those pieces are split. Um, concerned about what kind of confusion that's going to cause with members. Um, and, and kind of how much, how much you're going to get for that savings. So with the savings being just under 300,000 to move to option B or 400,000, is it gonna be you know, worth all of the explanation? And we may not get the ultimate goal, which is to increase use at the near site clinic. So your dental plan renewal for 21-22 is going to have no changes. So no increase on the dental premium for this coming year. And with that, I will open it up to any questions. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you, Susie. Questions or comments from board members? Commissioner Harder. Thanks for this report. I just, I wanted to ask a quick question about, we we had discussed at one point uh, a self-insure option, and I, I just wanted to, if you could discuss that a little bit. I know in the past um, it wasn't really optimal for a district because of our, our usage rate, but um, seeing as that's improved, and I think we're down, I think it was 101 something percent, um, would that bring us in a range where self-insurance would be more of a something to consider? It is actually something that Susie and I have on our planning for strategic planning, speaking with your administrative team that we work with. We have discussed with them the exploration of self-funding, also the potential of marketing the plan in the future. So looking at options, um, at this point you have one more basically contract year on the clinic so we had a three-year agreement with that. Um, and that is actually tied to your security health plan. So if you, if you move from security, you lose the clinic at the same time. So we wanted to make sure that we're looking long range, um, not just for a short-term gain. So we do wanna do education on self-funding as well as some long range strategic planning that'll put us in that better position to entertain self-funding and some other options going forward. That's great, that makes sense, thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd like someone to tell me if they can hear me right now. I can hear you just yeah. fine. <laughs> That's lovely. My video has frozen and I can't see if anybody else is waiting to talk. I think Phil, Phil Lyons, are you yeah. willing to ask a question? Okay. I would like to ask a question, yes. Certainly. I guess I was a little surprised um, that the year over year didn't go down more. And, and I guess I was surprised that it didn't go down more from 108% to 101% because, and, and you alluded to it a little bit, a lot of the elective um, procedures uh, have been deferred. Mm -hmm. And so we may be looking at a backlog of medical expenses in, in, in the coming year that is sizable. And, um, you know, I, I guess 
I thought in this particular year that number would have dropped more. And so what's 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 kind of rattling around in my head is just maybe it's a rhetorical question that it's it's really not about the high use of of our our members. It's more about the increased costs from the medical provider. Is that is that a fair kind of extrapolation of these numbers? Well, one thing that I do want to point out, so we share with your administrative team how you are running so they can basically see that chart from month to month. Um, with many groups, and Susie can chime in too, we actually saw those months drop. So you'd seek drops in February, March, and April where claims actually went down. Um, I have one group that, you know, sank below 20,000, you know. <laughs> So, so things bottomed out. With your group, that did not happen. So curiously enough, you had some high cost claims going on. So it kept your loss ratio in the normal, if not higher than normal range during that time period. So that's one of the things that has, you know, each group is a little bit different depending upon what you have going on. You happen to have some high cost items. So when someone is in the middle of cancer treatment or things like that, those things didn't stop. Um, while the rest of the world came to a screeching halt, a lot of those, you know, patients were still going in for chemotherapy or may still have been going in, you know, for those high cost services. So right now there is, you know, you've had some high cost claims this year that have kind of been pushing that forward, despite the fact that everybody else was staying home. <laughs> Thank you. Absolutely. Other comments or questions? Abby, is this something that you would need us to act on at the March 15th meeting? Or what's the timeline here? Yes, if it's possible to act on March 15th, that would help us um, at the district level be able to finalize our open enrollment dates and things like that. It takes us some time to coordinate all of those pieces. Okay, then we'll put it on as a sh I think a short individual item just because there's the three choices. Um, I, obviously we have a fairly clear recommendation coming from the administration, but we'll just put it on it as an individual item for next time. Okay. Um, and we'll, Thank you. we'll slot it in there. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Susie, for your time tonight. Thank you. You're very welcome. This time I will request any, or I will ask for requests for agenda items. Dr. Johnson. Uh, yes, I would like to uh, be provided an update uh, on the status in terms of what the uh, uh, district is doing in terms of supportive efforts to uh, move towards the uh, adapted or uh, voted upon four-day model for K-5. Specifically, I'm interested in uh, uh, continued efforts to ensure that our teachers have the, uh, the support and programmatic efforts uh, to ensure that this is successful. And uh, I would like that report made uh, 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 publicly to, uh, to the district at, at large. Thank you. Additional requests for agenda items. Seeing none, I would hear a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 We are adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Agenda setting 8 a.m. tomorrow, our next meeting, March 15th. This program was brought to you by a cooperation between NewsWorks and the Eau Claire Area School Board.